My name is Glenn Harris. For those of you I don't know, University of Georgia, Extension Specialist, Soils and Fertilizer, based here in Tifton, started in March of 94, so I'm going on my, what, 21st cotton crop, something like that. I'm still learning, so um, as you know. Uh, we're going to talk about fertilizing, and as you know, in past years, we've really been kind of hyped up on fertilizing and producing high yields, which, you know, that's not a bad thing. Um, We've had some good weather, made some good yields, but now cotton prices are down, so guess what kind of questions I get? Where can I cut? How can I make money on 60 cent? How do I fertilize for 60 cent cotton? And is it different than fertilizing for three or four bale? It might not be as different as you think. Uh, now, some of that, you know, has been generated by the corn folks shooting for high yields. And uh, you might have even seen they got a website called uh, Grow Big Corn I'm going to have my own website. It's going to be called Grow Big Beer. All right? So uh, this is from South Africa. Did a trip to South Africa. Apparently they grow things big down there. And the thing about when you try to push things and make do that, you always got to be careful you don't mess something else up. And I got to thinking about it. What would I do if I actually got that open? How would I deal with that? Well, I figured that out too. So <laughs> just do that. But you better be ready. And you might overdo it. I don't know. So there, there's a there's a hidden message in there. You think about that a little bit, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, even the corn conference this year, this was the title I was given to me: fertilizing lime in time of low prices. And we're talking commodity prices. Uh, the good news is the fertilizer prices aren't up. Um, I believe I don't have last year's in here. Um, and you've seen this slide before. Before 2005, we didn't hardly track fertilizer prices because they were low and steady. Nitrogen was about 28 cents per pound, phosphate was about 22, and potash was 12 cents per pound of K2O. I'm not sure we'll ever see those days again, unfortunately. Um, two, between 2005 and 2008, 2008 is a year we peaked. We were up around 85 cents per pound. I remember some county agents calling me and say, in, in 2009, is it going to be a dollar in, a dollar P, and a dollar K? Well, as you know, good. luckily they came back down in 2009. Potash didn't come down as much as N and P did. And now we've kind of bounced around. I'm missing a few years in here, but the one you want to focus on is, and these are the numbers that our economists are using right now. If you do those budgets, those crop comparison sheets, this is what they will use for N, P, and K. They're going to use about 62 cents for N about 43 for phosphate, and about 41 or so for K2O. So that's about where we are. Interesting to me, every year this time of year, people are always talking about, what are we going to plant? We're going to plant a bunch more peanuts. We're going to cut back on cotton. You know, What about soybeans? What about corn? And from a fertilizer standpoint, I put this together one year. It's kind of interesting. You know, there's no doubt corn takes the most, and, and, and this is only shooting for probably 150 bushel. You bump that up to 300 bushel, that's going to be significantly higher. Cotton is usually about half of what corn is, N, P, and K. Soybeans and peanuts, again, since they both fix nitrogen, we save a bunch of uh, money on nitrogen. Soybeans still need some P and K usually, and this is for a medium testing P and K, by the way. And then peanuts, you know, they fix nitrogen, it's good scavengers of P and K, so they usually don't need anything. Uh, wheat in a wheat soybean rotation. Uh, we're doing some meetings in Jefferson County yesterday. They said they're already side dressing the wheat. Um, and the interesting thing, this wheat soybean rotation where you put all the P and K on for both crops when you plant the wheat, you're basically just adding wheat and soybeans together when you do that. So anyway, just kind of put things into perspective about what they, what they need. Uh, by the way, and for those of you who know me, know just if you have a question anytime, interrupt. I don't like listening to myself talk 50 minutes straight either. But I can get bored. All right, so um, before I get into some just basic strategies and things, and hopefully we'll have time at the end of 50 minutes, um, I also do a lot of applied research, even though I'm basically 100% extension. Actually, I have some teaching appointment. We do a lot of applied research, uh, not only cotton, also work peanut and corn, and then all the basic uh, questions. 618 individual small research plots spread out over a number of studies, as you see here. 
Um, these are two of my technicians, Benji Baldry and Lindsey McDonald, who are in the room backing me up. They're my bodyguards as well as my technicians. Uh, appreciate their help. Don't make fun of my one row picker. It picks pretty damn clean. Let me tell you. And it'll even pick four bail. It wasn't designed for four bail, I can guarantee you. And it hunkers down and it struggles. But we didn't even have to put an extra fan up to get it up in that in that in that bag that we bag it away and with. Anyway, um, the two studies I'm actually going to hopefully get to today and tell you a little about is nitrogen side dressing source and high lime rates. But you can see some other things we worked on this last year: some starter work, some new sulfur-based fertilizers, a new polyhalite fertilizer, some byproducts, wood ash and recycled lime, which is a byproduct liming material. Uh, doing a little drip fertigation work down at Stripling Irrigation Park, putting putting N and K through the drip system on cotton, and then uh, I'm going to try to mention foliar K too. So that's some of the things we've done. Um, if there's something up there I didn't get to later on, I'll be around all day if you want to uh, <coughs> let me know. If there's something missing you think we really need to look at, um, this time of year it's a great time for me to try to figure out what's on growers' minds and, and people's minds, companies' minds, see what's going on. All right, so how are we going to deal with low cotton prices as far as fertilizing? This is nothing earth shattering, nothing new. You've probably seen it before. But uh, it doesn't hurt to, to review it again. And, and by the way, all this stuff is in our cotton production guides, the red books that you can get from the county offices. It's also online at ugacotton.com, our, our uh, University of Georgia cotton team website. Uh, obviously, soil testing. I think most people soil test every year like they're supposed to. We do have a lot of grid samplings going on and variable rate lime and P and K. I think variable rate lime is a great idea because pH is so critical. We want to be between 6 and 6.5. We do have some folks running higher. I see a lot up around 6.8, 6.9. That doesn't make me too nervous, but you're probably tying up things like manganese and zinc. You might start having problems. And if you get way over seven, you're probably using these high lime rates, and then you might even cause some other problems like potassium deficiency. We'll talk about that when we're talking about the lime rate study. Uh, I like to apply my P and K at planting, and if you know you got that pH manganese zinc relationship out of whack, a good opportunity to fix that is actually putting manganese and zinc in a starter if you use it, or put it out early, or foliar or feed it early. Hopefully you don't. Hopefully you have that straight, and we'll sh I'll show you those graphs next. Uh, starter on, on cotton is interesting to me. I like starter fertilizers on cotton and strip till early planted. But to tell you the truth, conventional late planted, I'm not sure how much benefit we get. We actually on corn, we say early planted corn, which in my opinion is all should be early planted. Uh, we actually recommend a starter. With cotton, we do not. Um, but like I said, in strip till, and if you want to talk about starters, we can talk about it. I don't like putting things in the furrow. That was the big trend the last couple of years, especially on corn. But remember, corn's a little hardier seed than cotton. You start putting things in the furrow on cotton, you're asking for trouble, in my opinion. I prefer a two by two, two inches aside, two inches below the seed, or a two by zero, two inches aside and on the surface. Um, it's kind of funny, every time I say two by two, I usually get a farmer in the county that I'm in, raise their hand and say, what about on the surface? I, I, we've done that, it works. What you don't want to do is put it in the furrow or put it right over the seed where it can, when the water hits it, go down and hit that, that seed. Oops. That's number one. Um, adjust NP and K for yield goal. Again, not as critical with cotton as corn, but we got that data. Split your nitrogen applications. Sometimes people say, why can't I put all my nitrogen out up front on cotton and get done with? You can, you can, two things. You get that cotton going off too early, you're going to miss some early fruit. And then with our sandy soils and rainfall and irrigation, you might run out the end. So we definitely like to put some at planting and some at side risk. <coughs> Sulfur, I'm going to show you if we get to it, a site where we did not put sulfur in it, and it was worth about a bale of cotton. So if you want to know how valuable 10 pounds of sulfur can be, 
it can be worth up to a bale of cotton if you don't put any else out. And then we can talk about tissue sampling a little and foliar feeding and things like boron. All right, so that's a basic strategy. Any question on that? Anything I'm, anything I'm missing? Yeah, flat leaf 10 pounds, so you got to put it out before planting and then come back with some more later? Great later question, or? great question. I get both those questions. I get when do you put it out and can I go higher or how much is too much? I get that question too. Our official recommendation is 10 pounds and it's worded funny, but it almost leads you to believe put it out at side dress. And I'll be honest with you, I like I like nitrogen side dress to have sulfur in it. Either 28005 or 18003 is liquids, or if you're using urea or ammonium nitrate, blend some ammonium sulfate in with it. And then that kind of takes care of itself. Technically, we might even want to put some early out, 10 pounds there, and then use because, for example, I calculated it last night, uh, 30 gallons of 28, 005, you're getting about 16 pounds of sulfur in that side dress. So, how high is too high? You don't need to get carried away. You know, you probably don't need more than 30 or 40 pounds of sulfur total. <coughs> and the nice thing about it is if you use a side dress that has sulfur, like I said, it kind of takes care of itself, in my opinion. Because it's all about the nitrogen-sulfur ratio and keeping that rate of plant. One time, and it was actually on cotton, and it was in Ware County years ago, I saw a sulfur-induced nitrogen deficiency. It's extremely rare. And I forget now how they actually did it, but they put a bunch of sulfur, but not a lot of nitrogen. And, and those two got to be in balance. So, and I can't remember. They, I do remember they had a sulfur ratio, I think, of about six to one. Uh, you want it about 10 to 15 to one, I got it on another slide coming up. You get it much above 18 to 1, you're going to see sulfur deficiency. Um, I've usually up around the, the date I'm going to show you where I lost the bale of cotton, I think they were about 23 to 1. So. Is that ratio the same? Most crops. It's real close. That, that 10 to 15, some might say 12, some might say 15, but it's real close to Yep. Yep. You know, and people talk a lot about ratios. And, and I don't talk a lot about a lot of ratios, but, but, but ones that have been proven and we know that's one of them, the nitrogen sulfur in the tissue. Uh, that's one, one ratio you can bank on. Um, pH real quick again, hopefully you've seen the slide before, going from 4.5 to 8, the wider the bar, the more available the nutrient in the soil, available for uptake. So what you notice is if you draw a line somewhere between 6 and 6.5, you hit most of those bars in a pretty good spot. It's not perfect, but you hit them in a pretty good spot. And what you notice is, is things like nitrogen, potassium, and phosphate are what I call cigar shape. They kind of taper off at both ends, but not too, too bad. But look at your micronutrients, manganese and zinc. You get your pHs up top, that bar gets real skinny, all right? And you're gonna force deficiency. So, now what happens a lot is, we raise our pH to tie up zinc so we don't have zinc toxicity on a peanut. And then what do we do? We force manganese deficiency. And we have, we have guidelines for that. This is how high you need to bring your pH to handle this much soil test zinc to avoid zinc toxicity in a peanut. And then this is how high to run your soil test manganese <coughs> as your pH goes up to avoid manganese deficiency. If it's the first time you've seen those graphs, you might get confused. You gotta think about it, let it sink in a while. I've, I've showed these graphs a million times, so I have a tendency to go fast. And you gotta flip the axis. Because here, here you're trying to raise your pH as your, as your zinc goes up to buy, avoid toxicity. And here you're trying to raise your soil test manganese as your pH goes up to avoid manganese deficiency. So it makes sense if you think about it. All right. See a lot of lime piles out right now. That's fine. Um, had the question last night from a farmer, you know, how many months in advance do I need to put my lime out? If you read the old, old uh, literature, it says six months. The new literature says three months. And why that is is because a lot of our lines we're using now have a lot more uh, finer particles than they used to. And the fine particles are the ones that react first and bring the pH up. Um, so you think about it, you're going to plant cotton May 1st, 
Right now, it's three months in advance, ideal. What happens if it rains again this weekend, gets real wet, can't get my lime out for another month? Do you wait till next year? No, <laughs> put it out. Because if you have a low pH, it ain't going nowhere until you put lime out. And, and really, there's enough fines in these new limes, um, enough fine material, it'll start coming up in about 30 days with some rainfall. It won't go up all the way as high as it does eventually, but it'll start coming up. So lime, lime is critical. Two other things going on with lime you might have heard about is dolomitic versus calcitic and these high rates. Um, dolomitic versus calcitic is pretty straightforward to me. Uh, dolomitic is the one that has magnesium in it and calcitic is not. Dolomitic lime is a really cheap source of magnesium. When you think about it, you get a lot for your lime and dollar. You get a pH adjustment so those nutrients are available and you get calcium and magnesium if you use dolomitic lime. Now, if you only use calcitic, you're only getting calcium, not getting your magnesium. Calcitic's probably cheaper. It should be. Doesn't have any magnesium in it. One problem we're running into already that I kind of saw coming is that we got some folks that are using calcitic lime, calcitic lime, calcitic lime. Their magnesium levels might have been good to start with. That's fine. But now their magnesium levels have dropped. Their limes are still high. Guess what? They need magnesium. They don't need any more lime, so they can't use dolomitic lime. What do they use? They got to use something like K-Mag. K-Mag's a great fertilizer, but it's fairly expensive. Per pound of magne magnesium, it's way more expensive than dolomitic lime. So what I tell people is that as long as your magnesium levels are good, you can use calcitic lime. What do we mean by good? We say above 60 in our system. And by the way, we use the same extractant as the private labs in this area. So. The recommendations aren't always the same, the levels, high, low, medium, high are always the same, but the numbers should be the same. So you're above a 60, you should be pretty good. You can use calcitic lime. You see it start dropping back, the pH goes down, go ahead back and use dolomitic lime. If not, you're going to have to put it out somehow else. Right. Also looking at a liquid lime. Um, still kind of experimental. First year they had us put it out at 166 gallons per acre. It raised the pH from six to seven in two weeks and held it all year. Looked pretty good. Come to find out, that's gonna cost about $300 of it. So, so then what do we do? The next year, we put it out at five and 10 gallons per acre. And I'll let you know how that works. I'm pretty comfortable with it as a pH adjustment. We're putting it on peanuts to see if it gets calcium into the peanut. I think it's gonna be pretty similar to lime because it is lime, it's just fine. Um, where this might come in handy, I have not heard of anybody putting through a pivot yet. Kind of waiting to see if, how well that works. I'm not. I think. I think out through the pivot will bring your pH up. I'm just a little worried it might clog a little, but I don't know that yet. Right. We use a flood tip nozzle on the end of a garden hose with a tank and a pump to put it out. We can simulate putting it out, almost like a pivot. That's on strip till. It even worked on strip till. You thought it would've got hung up on that residue? We took soil samples. They took soil samples. They, they kind of got down to the ground, didn't sample the residue itself, even two weeks after. Enough of it must've hit the ground or washed off to, to adjust the pH. So it's kind of interesting. All right. <coughs> Any other questions on lime? We'll get to the high rate lime thing then. Um, quickly. I told you we have ways to adjust for yield goals. When I first got here in extension 20 years ago, we had one recommendation, 60 pound of end for 750 pound of length. You guys remember that? We increased that. Now these aren't major increases. Again, this isn't like corn, but we say going up to three bale, 105 pounds of end. Now some people don't believe you can make three bale on 105 pounds of end. I can tell you you can, I've done it. Um, but you know, good tipton soil, good rotation. Yeah, you get on a sandy, wore out ground. My favorite technical term is the mic on. You got a highly technical term for some of that ground. I call it sorry ass dirt. Uh, you get on some sorry ass dirt and go 105, that might not be enough, right? Cotton after cotton for 10 years and sorry ass dirt, 105. You might need a 120. I normally don't go over 120. If you go over 120, you're probably battling something else. You're, you're trying to compensate for something else that's holding that plant back. 
The other thing is that somebody said, no, I'll never forget somebody in, I think it was in Decatur County, said, well, I used 240. I'm like, damn, that's a lot of nitrogen. They said, yeah, I put it all out at planting. I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, you're just hoping you're going to have some at the end of the year on that sandy ground down by Bainbridge left. So you got to split it like I've talked about. Um, there's the adjustments for P and K. The lower your soil test, phosphorus and, and potassium, the more difference there is and they come together. I'm just showing this to you to, so you know that we do adjust for yield goals. All right. What was not on that list of strategies of things to do? Things like this. All right. What's wrong with that picture? There ain't a whole lot in it. I don't care if you triple strength. My math's not real good, but what's three times zero? I think it's still zero, ain't it? They, they, can, they can testify. My math ain't good, but I do know three times zero is still zero. Uh, I, I'm being recorded, so I can't say what I probably usually say. But uh, there are a lot of products out there, and some of them got some stuff in them, and you got to watch the rates and all that. But if we just get back to the basics, I'm telling you, you can make some pretty good cotton. Just get your pH right, good N, P, and K, a little bit of boron, doing fruiting. It doesn't take all these bells and whistles and fancy stuff. I never said the word. You know, sad. I never did say the word. What are we going to say it for? <laughs> uh, quickly, and uh, fertilizer dealers can close their ears when I show this slide and turn their heads. Uh, they don't like this slide, but I've got to deal with it. Um, chicken litter. If you can get a good price for it, two tons of chicken litter pre-plant, still follow with some side dress nitrogen. It's a pretty cheap way to go, make some good cotton. Um, what I have here is I have how you calculate it. I just have it at three different key years. Let's look at right now. Average litter is about 60 pounds of N, 60 pounds of phosphate, 40 pounds of K2O. I probably need to adjust this slide. It's almost 60 of each now. There's your current fertilizer prices. There's your availability. Notice nitrogen we say is only 60% available. There's your value in N, P, and K added up. So I'm telling you, a ton of litter sitting there is worth about $56. Now, I'm not saying pay $56 for it. Hopefully, you're only paying about $30 or $35. And there's a good reason for that, too. And the reason I calculate this by N, P, and K is a lot of folks that have been using litter or doing a good job, they really don't need a lot of phosphorus. Well, look, there's $20 worth of phosphorus, so if you don't need it, now you're down around $30. So... So think about that. What's interesting is, again, before fertilizer prices went up, I used to tell folks it was worth about $25 a ton. And then when prices peaked, I didn't tell people. Now, people in Alabama told people. Anybody from Alabama here? You all know how I feel about Alabama, right? All right. Um, they were out there saying chicken litter's worth $100 a ton. I had a hard time saying that. I just kind of laid low and didn't answer the phone with that question. Now we're back down around here. Same pile of chicken shit, right? Get you? Right. The only thing to change is the value goes up and down with fertilizer prices. Any questions on chicken litter? Broiler, broiler, that's mostly what we got. Yeah, I deal a little with layer litter. I don't work much with turkey litter or quail litter. Half a pound of boron, breaker. You're either going to get soluble, which is sodium borate, or boric acid, which you can get, actually get in a bag, and then all of our liquids are more made of boric acid. That's our recommendation. I've done some research. Pretty much they're all the same, work the same. You can put stuff in boron, make it work a little better, but it works pretty darn good by itself. And you got to be careful, because I, I kind of find it interesting that a lot of times universities get accused of not recommending enough fertilizer. And we have this recommendation for half pound of boron, right? Well, there's a company out there selling, it's a 5% boron, when that in itself is not bad news, but six ounces per acre. All right? Growers say they love it. They don't have to carry a lot of liquid around. I tell them, yeah, you really didn't need to carry any around. Because you ain't getting a whole lot in that. 
if my math is right, and I already told you I'm not good at math, but I've gone through this about 10 times to make sure it's right. <laughs> Six ounces, there's 128 ounces a gallon, right? So that's that many gallons. This stuff weighs 11 pounds per gallon. So you have that many pounds of stuff, as we call it. I love that word, stuff. Some of the stuff we got. I got a neighbor that farms cotton we're talking about. What is in that stuff? I got this stuff. Anyway, uh, that many pounds times 0.05 because it's 5%, you're getting 0 0.025 pounds of boron in that six ounces. That ain't even close to a half a pound. And that would be fine if this stuff was 10 times better, but I've done the research. It's not. It's no better than anything else. So that's my public service announcement for today. Right. I, I got a question. Yeah. So the, the sodium chlorate, and when you go to the acid, the acid is HD pounds. That don't take on the boric acid but sodium chlorate. Right? I think I think sodium borate and boric acid as far as uptake and relief and all that are equally effective. I, I, I tested both. Quarter pound of soluble, a quarter pound of boron is soluble, a quarter pound of boron is boric acid. Pork acid might have worked a little better, actually, but, but, but not like twice as good, three times as good, nowhere near that. I prefer the liquids just because they're easy for in. People still use soil outside your door. Someone put it in a five-gallon bucket, pre-mix it, pour it in, just kind of acid. Um, the liquids are probably cost a little more, but how much is that convenience worth to be able to just pour it in, not worry about it clogging anything? I think it's worth something. Good question. Uh, sulfur, real quick, uh, 10 pounds, use these. There's your ratios, I already covered that. Um, I, I don't like to talk about a lot about corn on a, in a cotton meeting, but I want to tell you a story for a reason. Um, and I told somebody this the other day, I, I think it's kind of funny, you might have seen this before. This was my very first troubleshooting call in 1994. Lamar Martin was county agent in Tiff County. That's Dewey Lee with hair dark colored hair and uh, this is in Tiff County obvious sulfur deficiency if you notice it's right on the terraces Dewey knew what it was before we even got out of the truck I was fresh out of graduate school y'all some of you know where I'm from I don't tell you um, anyway never, never seen this before and I'm like all right what do we do so Dewey says we'll go to the plan analysis handbook see what the recommendation is so we made a recommendation to foliar feed sulfur it's like I don't know, 10 pounds of ammonium sulfate and like 30 gallons of water. Gotta remember, this is my very first call, fresh out of grad student. My office was over here in the RDC. I get a call a week later to go look at that corn. It looks like this. What? oh shoot. <laughs> we burned it. I'm getting out my resume, thinking what I'm gonna do for my next job. And uh, come to find out though, the grower admitted he got in a hurry and cut the water rate in half. So instead of using 30 gallons of water, he used 15. That got a little hot. I tell you this to tell you, I don't like foliar feeding sulfur. It makes me nervous. We have a tendency to burn things more than we do. So, so put some sulfur fertilizer on the ground at planting or put it in your side rest nitrogen. But if you, if you get to the point where you're trying to foliar feed sulfur, you're probably going to burn it more than you help it. Um, especially if you wait late and it gets real hot. So, uh, I'm going to skip some of this to get, the, that's foliar feeding. Really, the two biggest things I think to make a good cotton crop, especially when the commodity prices are low, <clears throat> as far as fertility, is pH and potassium. I think we're doing a decent job of nitrogen rates and splitting it. Uh, some folks think we're too high in nitrogen. Again, if you're above 120, you might think about what you're doing. Um, but really, pH and potassium to me is what it comes down to. This is a potassium deficiency at my research plots in, uh, at the Sunbelt Expo. Uh, this is on farm. This is potassium deficiency in Jeff Davis County. Can you see the streaks? Uh, I don't know if I've ever showed this to you before or not. This is where they had peanut the year before and windrowed the peanut hay and took it off. So you can see where they windrowed and left some hay and where they took it off. We had obvious potassium deficiency. It's kind of interesting. This is from a research plot. They say a picture's worth a thousand words. Hopefully you've seen this before. Basically, this is at Sunbelt Expo. Now this is a, a soil that is low in potassium. Soil test potassium, I forget the number, it's on one of these slides. It was like 43, pretty low. 
but this whole area had the same pH, nitrogen, everything else. The only difference is we did not fertilize with any potassium in that spot. And around here, we did make free bed. So um, I had a, a county agent one time, they're not in the room, I don't think today, and said, well, that, that's not fair. You went into a low soil test K field. You know what my answer was? I said, does Stanley Culpepper go in a field with no pigweed? Think about that. It is good to know, worst case scenario, what can happen. And in this case, we found out that you, can, you couldn't hardly draw this any better. That plot I just showed you, it's actually an average of four plots as we replicate with a 334 pound of lint. 45 pound of, of potash, 90, 135, 180, we went up. There's your soil test, potassium was 46. Our recommendation, our University of Georgia recommendation was for 135 pounds of K2O. And we made just under three bale. So I think that's pretty solid. Foliar, quickly, does foliar potassium work? Again, if you're thinking about saving money, where, is it, where it works is when you're coming up a little short. If you have plenty of potassium out there, this late foliar feeding K probably ain't helping you much. How do you know? You could try to take some tissue or petiole, that would help. But in this study, I got lucky and I actually foliar fed on top of the 90. I had some extra plots and if I had put it here, I don't think I would saw anything, or here. But I put like, two shots of potassium nitrate and gained 250 pound of lint. But one thing, I, the other thing I want to show you is we went from 1,077 to 1,327. We still didn't make it up to what we should have been if we did what we were supposed to in the first place, which is put 135 in. So, uh, I said that kind of fast and that was probably confusing, but basically foliar works when you come up a little short, how do you know that? Tissue and petiole is the best, but uh, I put this set of slides back in because I thought we got some new agents and all and doing some trainings, I thought, and, and I gotta uh, give credit to my buddy, Philip Roberts. He said, you need to take pictures of this every week, show how it changed. I really wish I had time lapsed this. It would have been pretty awesome. Um, but that's what a normal leaf should look like, right? And that's on July 10th. That's the early signs of potassium feeds. Now I gotta tell you, there are other things that can make a leaf look like that besides potassium, but I guarantee you this is a potassium deficiency because it was taking these research plots where I didn't put any potassium on it. All right, July 10th, August 9th, a little less than a month later, that's how far it has progressed. That's how fast it can happen. You got pretty severe potassium deficiency, the yellowing, and now you even got leaf spot coming in. All right, looking at the field, you can pick out the plots. These research plots are four rows wide by 40 foot long. You can see an alley cut there. You can see the zero plot on August 7th. That's what it looks like close up. This is what it looks like on September. Now it's starting to look like a checkerboard. So you can pick out the zero plot. This is probably the 30 pound rate. These good plots are your full rate of potassium. There you can see the zero rate already opening up for everything else. And that's right before defoliation, and that's after defoliation. So, never hurts to have a mental image of some of this stuff. Any questions on potassium? When is it too late to exfoliate? Great question, love that question. I, got, I, got, I, I answer that question a lot, you know, you can be able to tell. My cutoff is eight weeks ago. You've been doing it for eight weeks, I don't think you're going to any value. Um, well, I'm talking about like in the photo of the leaf. Yeah, the leaf. But, yeah. And, and you can almost do it more by week than that. Obviously, you catch it there, you're good. Uh, that one's probably a little too late. Somewhere in between is all I can tell you. You know, once you see a deficiency, you've probably already done some damage. Yeah. Uh, but if this happened so fast in a month, and then you can't do anything about it. If you had gotten out there during that month, you probably could have helped some. You wouldn't have helped everything. Um, so that's a good question. The critical time is fourth week of bloom. If things are gonna crash, it's fourth week of bloom. We make a lot of cotton the first four weeks. And fourth week of bloom is gonna crash. So you can follow your feed during that time and that helps you have some to, to feed you out. Or if you catch it around fourth, fifth, sixth week of bloom, I don't have any problem at all with following your feed. You get out to seventh and definitely get out to eighth week of bloom. 
burnt out and it's getting too late to really do a whole lot. And I also base that on our petiole program. Our petiole program, once you get the eighth week of bloom, we don't recommend any more fertilizer, any foliar feed. So it's based on it's based on some research if you go back far enough. Good questions. All right. Um, I'll let Bob Camaray handle more of the leaf spot issue, but just to tell you that uh, that's really severe. Um, you realize that potassium is linked to stemphilium leaf spot. Fungicides don't seem to help, but you can try to do things like we just talked about, foliar feeding or whatever. But there's another leaf spot, we call it target spot, originally we are calling it corn espera. We don't think this is related to potassium deficiency. If anything, it's related to too much nutrients, NNK and rank growth and everything. So two different kind of leaf spots. If you, if, if you know what to look for, you can tell them apart, call your county agent, consultant or whatever. And uh, but that one might respond to fungicide, but will not respond to potash. So you see they're opposite. So you got to know which one you're dealing with. Any questions on that? This one wasn't that bad last year because we weren't as wet, right? We still have plenty of this one, maybe not that bad. By the way, thanks, Scott Brown, for putting me on that site. Let's you know where that comes from. Bay, Georgia. Raise your hand if you know where Bay, Georgia is from. All right. Gotcha. Uh, quickly, um, I've used potassium nitrate as my foliar potassium for years. It's getting a little harder to get, a little more expensive. There are tons of foliar potassiums out there. Without even trying, I came up with 13 different kinds. Well, I guess 12 in an untreated check. I had this great study lined up at Expo. Even purposely last year, didn't put any potassium fertilizer on it, so I would force potassium deficiency. Guess what? I did too good a job. I had such severe potassium deficiency. I'm not even going to show you the data. We're going to do this again. But, but there's a couple things we're looking at. Uh, one is uh, some folks, there's a number of materials that have this potassium acetate in them, and some are claiming it's six times better <coughs> than potassium nitrate. And let me tell you, I've been doing this for 20 years, and most of the time when somebody says theirs is six or 10 times better, it doesn't always come out that way. I'm not saying it won't, but you gotta do the research to prove it or not. So we're, going, we're taking a hard look at that one. And then uh, we got a bunch of other things in here. So uh, some of them you don't get as much, some of them have some nitrogen in it, so it gets a little tricky, but uh, I'll let you know how that goes. There was some work done years ago that showed pretty much these are a bunch of different potassium materials. We're not going to go through them all, but actually there's a number of them that could work pretty well. Some need to be buffered. That's what these adjusted pH ones are to buffer them. Buffering potassium nitrate didn't help a whole lot. There's potassium thiosulfate. You know, you got all the potassium acetates down here somewhere. But uh, anyway, we'll continue to look at that. All right, any questions on potassium? I got 10 minutes to show you two studies. So I'm not going to be able to go into as much detail, but I'll just throw these two studies out there. One is side dressing nitrogen. Why are we even looking at it? One is, you know, we shifted from ammonium nitrate to urea. Why did we do that? Did we do that because we wanted to? Not really. We did it because we had to. And I don't think urea is as good as ammonium nitrate. I shouldn't be biased going in, but I didn't think it was as good. The other thing is we got a number of different liquids out there that have different compositions. Uh, most of what we use is 28005, which is made by UAN. It's about half urea, a quarter ammonium, and quarter nitrate. Well, we also got quite a bit of 18003 liquid, which is made with 19, and it's about 60% ammonium, 40% or 6% nitrate, 40 ammonium, no urea. Why does that matter? Urea is the one that can volatilize, nitrate is the one that can leach. They even made one that's called 24, that's an equal split, kind of spread your risk. So I've actually been looking at this on cotton and corn the last two years, starting to accumulate a lot of data, and guess what we're finding? There's kind of no clear cut winner or loser. A lot of times it depends on the, the soil type, if you have a dry or wet year and all that. So it get, but we're, but we're starting to see some trends. It's the kind of research you got to do a number of years in a number of places. But you get data like, there's our solids. Luckily, they're kind of color-coded. 
And you see the high-tech fertilizer applicators there, don't you? That's a McDonald's coffee cup, by the way. They didn't do that. Um, what I like to do with these graphs is kind of look at the high end and low end. This is across the street, 2013, calcium ammonium nitrate, 18 ammonium nitrate, they're all pretty good. What kind of fell out? The slow release nitrogen and urea. But then, what kind of year was 2013? Pretty much rained every day, didn't it, during the growing season? Go to 2014, now urea moved up a bit. They had a, a urease inhibitor <laughs> added this year because somebody said, oh, that's why urea is not working. That's not necessarily the case. Everything, a better cotton, everything did pretty good. 32, for some reason, fell out a little. You go to the Expo in 2013, a wet year, ammonium nitrate was up here. And again, the slow release and urea were down at the bottom. But you go to 2014, a drier year, urea moves up, and 32's down by the bottom. So that's kind of interesting to me. If you, if you put these all together, that's what we call four site years. Two locations, two years. What's interesting to me, ammonium nitrate, calcium ammonium nitrate in 18, they're all heavy on nitrate. Maybe cotton likes nitrate. And apparently it doesn't leach away from us. Is it? If it didn't leach away in 2013, when's it ever gonna leach away from us? Okay? The 19 is the same, the difference is getting nitrate and nitrate the same. I'm not, I'm not sure, yeah, I, you know, the, you would think maybe the 18 versus 19 here is due to sulfur, but then why 24's got sulfur in it? So it doesn't always add up. Now I'm gonna show you a site where it does make sense, but but I don't know, Scott, I really don't know. And all this was split plant? Yeah, what I did is I, I either put a base of, of some nitrogen out pre-plant, or sometimes I don't put any, because I'm afraid I'm not gonna see any response. And this is all, these are side dress materials. For, Head to, just one time, head to head, side dressed at, at somewhere between first square and first bloom. Yeah. What's that? All the same day. Yeah. Yep. Um, here's a dry land site. Now, dry land in 2013 is like irrigated, right? And uh, here's something really interesting. So, in a in a in a in a wet year, the slow release is down here. Same site in a dry year, it's up here. I think we got a clue of how that slow release one might need to be treated. Um, put the dry land together, 28, 18, urea 32, not too bad. Right. Um, the last one I'll show you is this one. This is at Stripling Irrigation Park, Camilla, deep sand. I thought they had put some sulfur out, they did not. So the only sulfur this cotton plant saw was from the side dress, and look, 28, 24, 18, and this is a mixture of urea and ammonium sulfate made up near three bale. Every, anything that did not have sulfur was two bale or less. Um, I can't find my slides. I might have accidentally erased them. I had obvious sulfur deficiency, yellowing. It doesn't quite look like nitrogen, but it was yellow as can be. I'm kind of surprised they made two bale, to be honest with you. But, but again, Low cotton prices, we need to make as much yield as we can. I guarantee you, it was worth having sold from your side dress at that so. I don't need an economist to tell me that was what I meant. Yeah, the, uh, the reason I ask is because when the urea, I was just checking to see about the volatility. Going back, it looked like the drier year, it did better than the, the wet year. Which is backwards. Yeah, and so that's Which is backwards. Nice. Yeah, uh, the REC pivot, Expo, and Stripling are all irrigated, uh, center pivot irrigated. ABAC's the only dry land site, but again, in 2013, we got a lot of rain. I don't think, you, I'm not telling you not to use urea, but urea is the one to me that looks inconsistent. And I don't think it's all because of volatilization, because I irrigate my urea in. We pretty much try to get turn the pivots on as soon as we put them out. So something else is going on there, in my opinion. So. We've done a little bit of this ourselves. And where we did the urea and the ammonium sulfate, we split up all the zero. I can't see it anymore. I can't tell you the yield. But it goes back to the sulfur as well. Yeah, you, you got to be careful because, you know, if you're going to compare them head to head, you know, I mean, I, you know, I can take the sulfur out, or I'm kind of glad I didn't in this case because we see how bad it can be. Um, so you, you do have to try to be careful. 
you know, comparing apples and oranges. Whereas in Australia, they say chalk and cheese. You ever think about that? Comparing apples and oranges, they're at least kind of fruits, right? But I don't want to eat no chalk. So they say chalk and cheese. I think that's better. Anyway. Um, well, I, I'm, I got four minutes now to show you my high lime trial. But you're going to see this again from me, so we can, we can introduce you to this. Uh, what I'm worried about with the high lime rates are potassium deficiency because we knock all the potassium off the exchange sites. We can talk about that later. I worry about tying up manganese and zinc with high pHs. Um, the company has recommended up to 20 tons per acre. That's what 20 tons per acre lime looks like. Uh, this is actually what 10 tons per acre looks like. It's probably not as thick as you as you think, but it's pretty. That's pretty high rate. Um, what we did is we got two locations: Fire Tower, Tipton Soil Rep Street, and then Bowen Farm, about four or five miles east of here on a sandy flatwood soil. This location we had enough room for zero, one, five, and ten tons per acre. Here we only had room for zero, one, and five. We actually split the plots and used dolomitic calcitic to get at that magnesium issue. Also, we found out that the company that's promoting this thinks their calcitic is way better than every other calcitic. So I think Lindsay named it magic calcitic. I'm blaming you anyway. Uh, it takes the heat off for me. Um, you know, theirs is a lot better than everybody else, so we just call it magic. And uh, the other thing we did is on these zero pH plots, we put a bunch of gypsum out. And the reason we did that is because I went to a meeting and these folks said pH doesn't matter. It's all about calcium which goes against everything I've ever been taught and any soil science has ever been taught. And normally it doesn't happen because normally if you lime good, you have good pH and good calcium. But in this, situ this situation, we have an opportunity. We have a low pH and we put a bunch of calcium. Gypsum should not affect the pH much. So keep that in mind. Um, put it out by hand. We got behind, put it out in June. So it is late planted cotton. Haven't had a lot of time for the lime to, uh, it is irrigated though. There's the piles. Took almost all day to put it out, I think. I like to kill a student worker with heat stroke. I know the signs of heat stroke now. When they're on their knees crying for their mama, it's heat stroke. All right. And what do you do? You run them up to the building, throw them in the air conditioning, and hope they survive. Anyway, uh, that's what it looks like from the air. I borrowed Philip Roberts' drone. That's me right there. It's kind of a cool looking picture. You can see where we drove the truck through with the buckets because it was too heavy to carry all the time. Here's the data quickly. On a Tifton soil, we didn't see a lot of response to the lime. If anything, we kind of tapered off going down at the high lime rate, probably potassium deficiency. Didn't matter which source, and it didn't seem to matter this idea on, this, you gotta remember this is low pH with gypsums. It actually looked like that high gypsum again, probably for some potassium issues. But still not bad all overall, right? Look at Bowen Farm. At the low pH, we only made 372 pounds of lint. But with one ton of lime, we made two bale, and five tons, we, we bumped up. So we got a response to the pH there. But again, it didn't matter what source, and this theory about it don't pH don't matter, it's all about the calcium, I think we already proved that wrong. Because if that's the case, these plots would have been more like these. But you see what they do. All right, we're going to keep going with this. We're going to plant cotton again next year. Eventually, we're going to go to corn and peanuts. We're taking soil samples just about every month. We're going to take some deep soil samples to see if it leaches down and helps anything. So it's going to be a, it's a long-term commitment. All right, that's what it looks like in the field at Bowen Farm. That's your 372-pound cotton next to some of your two-bale cotton. And uh, I'll finish with this. Um, I do a lot of field days. Uh, some of you have seen this before, but anybody hasn't seen this before, want to guess where that's taken? Is that a peanut field day? Somebody said Bainbridge, somebody said Irwinville. That's in South Africa, that's where, same place where I got my big beer can picture. They do things weird, they put me up on a pallet, I thought that was kind of weird. Uh, but, uh, oh, and, they, and they, they still make these little piles Kind of like stack miniature stack poles, picking this by hand. They call them whoopies. So they said they were making whoopies. All right. There wasn't a peanut on the ground. I think anything that didn't get in the wagon, they ate it. So uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, they still have 
calcium problems on peanut just like we do, pod rot and pops. But uh, I got to see some interesting things. I went to a lion park. They put me in a tent next to the fence and said about 2 o'clock in the morning they're going to wake you up roaring. But they were wrong. They started at 1 o'clock. And uh, I wasn't real comfortable in that tent. First thing I did is check that fence real good, looking for holes. Um, if you go hunting there, they start you out with a small one, a spring box, and bring you up to this one. It's called a sable. Uh, my favorite, these are all pictures I took, by the way. This was my favorite. I don't think you're allowed to shoot him. I'm not really sure what he tastes like. Probably chicken. I don't know. Um, but this was my favorite if you're going to be a hunter, right? Look. That one's got a target already on it. <laughs> that one's saying, you're going to shoot me in the ass, ain't you? That's what that, one, that one's saying. That's what, all, right. all right, I'm done. I think I'm right on time. Any questions real quick? Sorry I didn't leave a lot of time for questions, but I'll be around.